Hello, everyone. Welcome to our first virtual panel of 2022. It's my pleasure to welcome you. My name is David Meltzer. I'm the Secretary General of GVF. GVF is the Global Trade Association for the Satellite Industry with members uh, from the entire satellite ecosystem in all regions of the world. And it's, again, my pleasure to welcome you. Uh, you'll notice uh, from your screen that we have partnered with Connectivity Business for this year's series of webinars. Connectivity Business is part of the Royal Media family of publications and uh, PR services. Uh, Royal Media, in case you uh, didn't see in our January 18 press release, uh, we formed a content partnership with Royal Media. And in addition to publishing Connectivity Business, they have other brands and client relationships in the financial services, energy and transportation sector, and obviously very important verticals for the satellite industry. And we're very pleased to welcome uh, the partnership with Connectivity Business and in turn, Royal Media. Also want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, which you can see at the bottom of your screen, Proactive International PR. Uh, they're a UK-based firm, they are international, and they are a business-to-business -business public relations consulting firm that focuses on telecoms and technology, and very much a word of thanks to Proactive International for sponsoring this. So let me take a moment to introduce our panelists. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Manor. Jennifer is the Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Echostar Corporation and Hughes Network Systems. And Jennifer is responsible for the company's domestic and international regulatory and policy issues, including spectrum management, new technologies, and market access. And I always like to, uh, in introducing panelists, give a little interesting factoid. And for Jennifer, her interesting factoid is that she is widely published on telecommunications issues and most recently issued a book entitled, and very appropriate for this panel, Spectrum Wars, The Rise of 5G and Beyond. And a final note about Jennifer, she's an award-winning documentarian film producer. Next, I'd like to introduce Alex Efestein. Alex is the manager for International Regulatory Affairs and Spectrum Engineering at Amazon's Project Kuiper. And in this role, Alex is responsible for defining the strategy, leading technical studies, and developing contributions related to the World Radio Communications Conference agenda items and ITU activities for ITU working parties, and regional groups. And the interesting factoid about Alex is that prior to Amazon's Project Hyper, he was with Boeing and NASA. And Alex holds a BS in electrical engineering, as well as a master's in wireless telecommunications. So very much a highly educated and knowledgeable and experienced panelist. Next is Mahanad Jawad. Mahanad is responsible at Intelsat in assisting its long-term strategy spectrum position in the marketplace. And in his role, he works closely with the company's vice president on corporate and spectrum strategy and the spectrum strategy team to analyze and identify emerging spectrum opportunities and risks for Intelsat. Additionally, Mohanad is responsible for managing efforts from Europe, Middle East, and Africa that protect, optimize, and leverage the company's spectrum assets in support of Intelsat's broader long-term growth strategy. And the interesting factoid about Mahani, which I did not know and, until just uh, prior to this call, is that Mahani holds a, a PhD as well as a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering. And finally, there's Daniel Ma. And Daniel is Vice President, Legal and Regulatory Affairs at SES. And he is uh, responsible for SES's government policy and regulatory activities in the US, Canada, and the Asia Pacific region. And Daniel also holds a doctorate as well as a master's degree in law, and of course, a bachelor's degree as well. So all of you, thank you very much for taking the time to join the panel. And just to remind the audience why, why we've uh, pulled this panel together. Um, and I think everyone in the audience and certainly the panelists are now really thinking it's just a little over a year from now that the uh, Quadrennial World Radio Communications Conference is held, uh, if you will, the Olympics of the regulatory world. Um, and uh, every four years, um, uh, regulators from around the world gather to make decisions affecting the satellite industry as well as other industries focused in, in particular on spectrum matters. Uh, many of us in the satellite industry 
are familiar with uh, the importance of spectrum regulation, but not everyone. And really, uh, the hope is that this uh, webinar answers the question, why does spectrum regulation matter? So with that, we get to the fun part. We're going to turn to the questions. So um, I'm going to ask the questions. And by all means, panelists, um, feel free to, to jump in with your perspectives. And my first question, and I'd like to start if you will, by looking back in time. And we're gonna certainly look forward in time as well, but let's think about um, the World Radio Communications Conference, that, that Olympic event, uh, which is um, held every four years. And most recently was held in 2019 and before that in 2015. And as you think back uh, to those ancient times, those pre-pandemic times, um, what decisions taken in 2015 or 2019 today are having a significant impact on your company, or if you want to speak more broadly about the industry? Um, I think it's very important that we, we focus on what happened that today is impacting the, uh, the industry or your company in particular. So who would like to take this question first and just uh, you know, jump in or show, show of hands? Otherwise, I'm going to call on you. All right, Alex, uh, you were the first one, and thanks very much. Alex, over to you. What, what, what was decided in 2015 or 2019 that is really impacting us today? Thank you, David, and uh, thank you for having me on this panel, and, and good day to everyone participating. So as you mentioned, every WRC is, is very important. It takes decisions that impact the bottom line of telecommunications companies and, uh, and actions worldwide. At WRC 19, I'd like to highlight two very specific actions that took place that will affect the bottom line of the NGSO industry, which my company is uh, planning an NGSO system. The first is the development of NGSO milestones, and these milestones provide regulatory foundations for how, uh, by what time frame, we must deploy our satellite system. And the WRC took specific actions indicating that we need to have a certain percentage of our system up two years after a regulatory time period, five years, and then the full constellation deployment after seven years. So obviously this decision is very important and affects the bottom line of my company because it affects the development milestones we have as well as the financial implications of when we have to plan our launches and also start our services. So I would say that this decision was in, fundamental in, in the operation of all NGSO systems. The second big decision that was made at uh, WRC 19 that's specific to the NGSO industry, and I would also say uh, to the GSO as well and the entire FSS uh, fixed satellite service organization is, um, the development of regulatory provisions uh, for NGSO systems to protect GSO systems in the QV band. These are frequency bands from 37.5 to 51.4 gigahertz. And this is an important expansion band for NGSO systems in general. So prior to WRC 19, there wasn't really any regulatory provisions. So the development of these provisions really set regulatory certainty for NGSO systems to expand into the Q and V band. And also the provisions that develop allow for flexibility for NGSO operations while protecting GSO. So the, both of those um, milestones or those developments at WRC are, are very important for the operation of NGSO systems and also impact our bottom line, our ability to design and our ability to operate NGSO systems. So the, the WRC decisions are very important and in fact, very particular to NGSO systems and the FSS industry as a whole. Thank so is it, thanks Alex, is it fair to say that those decisions really drove the, the multi-billion dollar decision uh, to, to undertake Project Kuiper? I wouldn't say the, the petition in particular, but they really drive our development timeline and how we are, we are approaching uh, the development and launching of our system. Got it. Thanks very much. Who else wants to look back in time? Jennifer. So thank you, David. Um, and thanks for inviting me here today. I'm thrilled to be with my fellow panelists. I want to kind of take this up a level and really talk about three key areas that are involved in the WRC and then give some examples. Um, First is obtaining access to new spectrum, which 
everyone always needs, all industries. Second is protecting existing spectrum. And the third is obtaining increased flexibility on use of spectrum. And just to walk through some examples, um, obtaining new spectrum, um, I think one of the one of the big outcomes of uh, 2019, which now seems so long ago since we were back in person, was obtaining another one gigahertz of spectrum for the satellite industry at 51.4 to 52.4 gigahertz. Um, that was an important band for us as we're starting to develop Q and V band systems. So it was an important growth system. We also obtained a new agenda item, and I don't remember if there was a new spectrum one in 2015, so forgive me. My memory doesn't go back that far, but um, but we also obtained a new agenda item for additional spectrum at 17.3 to 17.7 gigahertz in the FSS that's going to be considered this year. In terms of protecting spectrum, I think one thing that's near and dear to everyone on this panel's heart is what happens to the KA band or the 28 gigahertz band. And at work 15, up until, if I remember, 6 a.m. or so, the last morning of the conference, it was unclear if, this, if the 27.5 to 30 gigahertz band, which is critical to our company's business, and I, I know for my fellow panelists, was going to be considered for identification at work 19 for IMT. And, and that was a resounding success for the satellite industry in that we took it off the table. Um, actually, it, it almost came to a vote. And if my, I'm pretty good at counting numbers, I could count to four supporters and everyone else in the room was against it. And I, I think my uh, favorite quote of the conference was someone from the developing world spoke up and said, we don't have 2G, what do I care about 5G? Um, <clears throat> in, in, the, in arguing for the need to retain 28 gigahertz per satellite. Unfortunately, I do think this is gonna come up again at this conference. In the, in the lines of a, of a 2023 conference as some sort of future agenda item. So we've, all of us have worked together very closely. I can think of many conversations with all the gentlemen on the panel um, where we're looking to protect spectrum and then flexibility. And I think flexibility needs to be defined in a way I think that overall the satellite industry looks to and that's um, when use our stations in motion which is incredibly important to all of us. And that's being able to use FSS allocations in a way that creates flexibility. We discussed that in 2015. It was an agenda item at 2019, I believe, and also is coming up again for NGSOs at 2023. Um, but what that doesn't mean, and what we're seeing a trend, and I know this is a later question, but I wanna raise it here, is some, some um, participants are now urging that we should carve out spectrum for specific applications like IoT and, and at least my view and my company's view is that that's a very, very dangerous approach because you don't know what that means and it doesn't give you the ability to use things in the future. With eSIMs, we're simply allowing the use of technology in a current spectrum band. And that's really important because you wanna provide flexibility. And I think that's chosen to be the right approach. And you'll see, um, even with the pandemic, I think that's a booming business, even though we have less aircraft and flying and less ships and everything else. Um, so with that, David, awesome. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, Mahana, Daniel, anything you want to look back in time to uh, from 2015, 2019 and say it really matters today, those decisions taken back then? Maybe um, I see Daniel's still on mute, so I, I can uh, jump in. Include, uh, I'm sure he'll do a, a very great conclusion to this question. First of all, thank you very much, David. Uh, really honored to be here. Uh, it's always great to be with you and all the, uh, also with the analyst um, and hope to see you all in person soon. So uh, much like what Jennifer said and what Alex said, I'll try and also talk about some of the opportunities that came out from WRC 19, some of the challenges or the, you know, the, the spectrum that we need to protect, but also some insights maybe for the audience to, to, to be aware of. In terms of the opportunities, as Intel said, as you all know, we, during the COVID period, uh, acquired GoGo, which is uh, the largest, if not one of the largest uh, service providers for in-flight connectivity. Um, and what we call in the industry ESIM, so air stations in motions. Um, with that acquisition for uh, a company like GoGo, Intel said is, is really entering the in-flight connectivity market with a direct access to the, to the airlines and the relationship between the satellite operator 
and the airlines is now, um, you know, we, we remove the middleman, the service providers, and we're directly engaging with the airlines. And with, with that, uh, what really happened at the WRC19 was an outcome for an agenda item for new spectrum in KU band 13 gigahertz for eSIMs, for the type of applications that GoGo will, will, uh, will provide to the airline industry, but also to the maritime industry as well where uh, other satellite operators that use that spectrum will now hopefully um, be able to provide services where terrestrial connectivity is not able to in the international waters, but also in international airspace. So that's a, a really great opportunity for us to complement our acquisition with, with GoGo, which is called commercial aviation now. Um, and also uh, much like uh, my um, colleagues mentioned, the QNV band, this is a new frontier for the satellite industry where, uh, again, as Intel said, we're also moving into the NGSO world with a MEO constellation. And Q and V-band is really a new uh, spectrum uh, that has been identified for satellite for a long time. But now you'll see an actual uh, procurement, an actual tangible um, interest in, in that from the satellite industry. So we definitely look forward for that uh, challenge to how we can maximize our access to that spectrum. Um, as for the defense, I would say uh, from our point of view, the relentless um, spectrum grab by the mobile industry for more and more spectrum. We're seeing this since WRC 17, um, you know, decades now. Uh, every time we come to a WRC, there's more spectrum supposedly needed for, for delivering mobile services. But we think the prudent thing to do is to have a balanced approach to make sure that in distance spectrum that's already harmonized is licensed. And therefore we are um, uh, aware of this relentless uh, push for mobile spectrum. And let's not forget that satellite industry has a role to play with 4, 5G and the future of 6G. So that's something that we are aware of in terms of defending and how to make sure regulatory certainty is available for us. In terms of the insights, I think a lot of these achievements that Jennifer and Alex mentioned wouldn't have been possible without the administrations because at the WRC, it's really a member state driven uh, conference and we don't get to say it's the members and the regulators around the world from developing new market, new uh, emerging markets as well as uh, you know, uh, well-established uh, markets where satellite is being used. You see the member states are actually advocating and defending satellite spectrum, which is a, a, a great thing to see because they realize that they need the spectrum for their industry and for their services and for bridging the digital divide because really having a holistic approach is what really matters. And I hope that's something that we uh, successfully achieved the last WRC. So that's a great insight that uh, I picked up from, from the last conference. Over to you. Thanks very much, Mahanid. So uh, I think some of the key messages uh, coming out of uh, your response, for me at least, is uh, decisions taken in the past underlie decisions to make uh, investments, uh, whether they be acquisitions like in GoGo -Go or uh, investments in new spacecraft and Q and V bands. And then, of course, as you mentioned, the ongoing uh, spectrum wars, uh, to borrow a, a phrase, um, where uh, certainly it, it seems like uh, the mobile industry is always uh, grabbing spectrum uh, without, in any case, uh, in all cases, I should say, having a, a justifiable business case for it. Daniel, um, any observations looking back on time uh, for you? Sure. Um, I mean, the the benefit and, and, and difficulty of going last is, of course, a, a lot of the points I wanted to make have already been made by my colleagues. Um, uh, the spectrum grab aspect, uh, the um, uh, and how these decisions that are made at WRC 19, 15 and 19 affect what we're doing today. I wanted to just uh, follow up on something that, that, that Jennifer said about the KA band, uh, the 27.5 to 2, 2, 2.30. Um, we narrowly avoided having to deal with it, with the loss of that band at WRC 19. Um, at the very end of the WRC 15 conference. Um, and that has enabled, I think, um, the, the industry to invest with more confidence in the band, to continue investing. The, the, the uh, horrible thing is that we were already investing, but um, apparently our investments didn't count. Um, but, um, but the WRC 19 outcome uh, really helped us uh, 
continue to invest with some confidence in the band. And there are now over 100 geo and thousands of non-geo satellites uh, in orbit using this band. Um, and nearly all of the latest high throughput satellite designs, including the new LEOs and, and, and our own you know, O3BM power system, we, we all use this band. Um, and these wide bandwidths av uh, available in the K-band have really enabled modern HTS systems to deliver so much more than before. Um, so I, I like to focus on, on the success um, that has been generated uh, in the K-band uh, because of WRC 15 and 19. Um, but that doesn't mean that the, that the threats are over. Um, countries and companies continue to try to go after this ban, even though there's hardly any need to do so. Um, in contrast to what we've been doing in the ban, the evidence from the countries that have allocated this ban for 5G, it's, it's, it's pretty... Um, uh, it's quite stark. Um, the demand for the ban on the terrestrial side is very uh, uncertain. Um, the, the case of Korea is very instructive. They were one of the big proponents for, uh, for 5G in, uh, in, in the uh, uh, 28 gigahertz. Um, and three years after they auctioned the spectrum, they brought out 200 base stations, which is terrible for the short range spectrum. Um, they were supposed to build out 45,000 base stations and if they built out less than two, than, than less than two hundred, so I think the lesson that we want to, I think, take from that is that you know we have to have some confidence that that we might not be as big as the mobile industry, but we do some important things, um, and we demonstrate it over and over again with our with our good use of spectrum and the important and the compelling use cases that we make of it, um, and it's and it's 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 important for us to to remember that and to proceed with confidence. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel, and very much a, a good message that the satellite industry is known not to hype, but uh, when it speaks, it speaks with authority uh, and reality. Um, all right, I appreciate everyone's uh, look back in time. Um, I want to now shift gears into uh, your everyday jobs, if you will. Um, and um, really, I'm, I'm keen to understand in your everyday job, how do you, as a spectrum expert, how do you work with colleagues on the business side of your company uh, to develop strategies and really talk about what, what is an ideal partnership between the regulatory side and the business side, whether it's strategic development, uh, whether it's um, maybe even on the sales side, but how is the relationship uh, best um, promoted between the, the, the regulatory side and the rest of the company? Um, who wants to take that, that question first? Thanks, Daniel. Go ahead. And you now have the benefit of being the first speaker. Uh, and everyone can say Daniel was brilliant uh, in his earlier no. comments. No. Um, well, thanks. Thanks, David. Um, so, you know, if it's not clear already, Spectrum is like the lifeblood of our industry. Um, so it is only natural for the Spectrum and us regulatory experts to work together with our business folks um, to achieve our objectives. I mean, at the operational level, this is a very prosaic sort of collaboration, but it's an important one where we ensure that the systems that we deploy comply with regulatory and frequency coordination requirements. You know, things are authorized, uh, we meet technical parameters, all of that stuff. Um, and we also work together operationally to deal with things like uh, interference resolution, um, if and when it arises. Um, and um, that's our day-to-day -day bread and butter, but it's, 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 it's actually quite, quite important to make sure that, that, that that's maintained. Um, at a strategic level, um, the collaboration that we have with our business folks ensures, you know, it sort of involves securing the spectrum that we need for the future, whether it's a new frequency band um, or a new orbital slot or a new, you know, orbital, you know, uh, a new Leo constellation, uh, rights for a new, new, new constellation. And that's, that's, um, that, that's the sort of strategic level thinking and collaboration that we work on. Um, we also work together to make sure that the technical conditions um, that are being developed at the ITU and the national level um, are sound and, in, and actually enable us to deliver the services that we want to deliver to our customers and that our customers want. So, um, you know, that's a reflection of our day-to-day -day and month-to-month -month, uh, work. Thanks, Daniel. And I think you really underline the, the many ways uh, you know, Spectrum matters to companies such as yours at SES. Um, any of the other speakers want to talk about the day-to-day -day business relationship between you and your, your department and other departments in your company? 
Yeah, I, I can jump in, David. Okay. Thanks, Alex. Go ahead. So I think just following up on what, what Daniel said, I, I think close collaboration with uh, with business teams and, and understanding priorities is very important to our day-to-day -day work. Because as I mentioned, uh, a lot of the work that we're working on at the ITU and also regulatory proceedings around the world, uh, as mentioned, you know, the IMT spectrum grabs around the world will definitely impact our ability to operate. So working closely hand in hand with, with the business teams and also the, the technical teams to ensure that the regulatory provisions that are developed or are being developed will ensure that we will be able to provide services in the manner that, that we need is very, very important. And I would also add that, um, I, I would also add that I think the business teams have a lot of discussion. So I think it's very important to, once an idea becomes actionable to start working and understanding the regulatory provisions to prevent uh, rework and, and unnecessary problems uh, down the line. So I think cooperation between business and, and regulatory is, is very important for ultimate success of uh, the satellite industry and individual projects and, and business objectives. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. And uh, we're starting to get questions from the audience. And I just want to uh, thank those uh, people who have put questions in. We'll be getting to them shortly. Uh, but if you haven't already uh, done so and you want to ask a question, again, please use the, uh, the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen, not the chat function. Okay. Um, again, back, back to this question, uh, Mahanad or Jennifer, uh, do you want to add anything in terms of um, you know, how do you work with your, your colleagues in other departments? Uh, if, if I may, uh, sure, Jennifer, I, I think this is a great question because outside our day job, we get asked this question by friends and family. <laughs> Hard to explain to them. They don't understand. They think sometimes we work in a secret service because we're talking about different countries all the time. And, and, and it's a really niche market, as, as my colleagues mentioned. Uh, we know each other very well. We work with each other on a daily, weekly basis. And I think that's a great thing about our industry when you compare it to other industries that how well we push above our weight in terms of collaboration. Uh, Spectrum is integral to our uh, interest. I mean, Intelsat has over 52 satellites and we operate third party satellites, but that's not our core asset. The core asset is the Spectrum that we rely on. And the regulatory certainty for that spectrum is vital to our industry. So really spectrum sits at the core of all our uh, respective companies. And it's great because we get to um, observe the procurement of future projects. So we play a role, for example, uh, at Intelsat with the MEO constellation that we're working on, we get to give them from step zero, not even step one, what is the forecast of the spectrum that the payload will utilize? Is it uh, secured? Is there a regulatory certainty there? Um, is it shared with other services? How can we define um, the, the, the frequencies that we want to use in which region? So all of that is important for the future outlook for our procurement in, in, in the future. But also in the current day-to-day, -day, I'll give you an example that I mentioned about um, you know, 5G and, and the terrestrial services and C-band. We are making sure that we have a campaign in, in place so that our customers are well protected, insulated, but also where mitigation measures and migrating them sometimes needs to occur. That is fed from the spectrum department into uh, asset management or the network side of things. We tell them that this is going to be under threat or this is not going to be under threat. So that kind of thing plays an integral role for us. And uh, I'm really privileged to be in this industry uh, to with such experts, and hopefully we will uh, ensure that um, the future outlook for our industry continues to be stable. Thank you. Thanks, Mahanid. And uh, Jennifer, over to you. Go ahead. Thanks. So I agree with everything my colleague said. Um, so I was going to say like we always do, but Daniel would know I would be lying. Um, so, um, but most of the time, but I, I think the one piece that I didn't hear, which I'm sure we're all involved, which, which is looking for opportunities ourselves. Um, you know, we certainly we're on the ground. We we probably know more about the usage of spectrum and what our companies need than anyone else and what's possible in the regulatory world. So I think one of the things we do bring 
And, you know, we have regular meetings internally where, you know, we'll, we'll say, well, you know what, maybe we should look at, at this sort of now, yeah, maybe we should look at this, you know, should we look at uh, NGSO? Should we look at this, but in what bands, what bands do we think are possibilities? Remember, this is an endurance game. This is not a sprint. And I, I think sometimes, and I know we're going to talk about this later. I think sometimes the business and technical teams get a little frustrated with us because we, we may be talking eight years out, right? We, you know, we have an upcoming conference and we have to start thinking about what do we want in 2027? You know, so, so there is that, but I, I think the opportunities that we may see um, is something that's incumbent on us to do um, and something that I think all of us do. And that's why we come up with, with some you know, new and novel ideas. So, so I think that's something that we bring and then we have to go to people and start them thinking as well as vice versa. We're not just reactive, we're, we're also proactive. Thanks, Jennifer, and uh, thanks for the excellent additional point. Um, we've got about a half a dozen questions from the, uh, the audience. And before turning to them, let me, let me ask one, one final question uh, uh, from my perspective. Um, and I think mm -hmm. it was Daniel earlier on talked about uh, in, in defending uh, 28, talked about investments already made in the firm in the form of uh, satellites that have been purchased. Um, in your experience, um, what argument works best from the decision makers, the regulators, in, in, in terms of whether to preserve spectrum rights for the satellite industry, give it over to the rapacious uh, mobile industry? Um, is it the fact that you know, the industry has already made billions of dollars of investment decisions? Is it the fact that um, public policy objectives such as the digital divide or a rural health or distance education? Is it the fact that you've got existing customers or future customers or is it all of the above? Which arguments do you think, again, in the, in the eyes and the mind of the regulator, which arguments have the most currency, the most persuasive? Jennifer? Yeah, so I've had the opportunity to serve three times as a regulator. Um, so very familiar with this where people come and make a case, you know, both, you know, at a high level at the FCC and the commission level, and then as a senior staff member in the bureaus, uh, including the Office of Engineering and Technology um, at the FCC. Um, the most important issue, I think, is probably use. And if you can't come in with hard data that you're using the spectrum and that the incoming uh, use is going to cause problems, from a technical perspective and jeopardize those, you are likely not to win um, at least, and I'm not saying that the, the terrestrial industry always does this, but I'm, I'm talking from a satellite perspective. You know, if you're protecting spectrum, if you're going into new bands, that, that's a different story. But if you're protecting spectrum, actual use is required. Um, and we actually saw that um, at the last WRC with regard to the 40, 50 gigahertz band where we did get additional spectrum allocated, but portions of those bands were also identified for IMT, probably more than the satellite industry wanted because we had very, very light use at that time. Um, so, and I think that's one of our struggles, David, is our networks take a lot longer to deploy than terrestrial networks. Even, even the LEOs, which are working at a much faster rate than GEOs, you know, still take time to, and, and these are complex systems, of course, they take time to deploy. And so getting into service, you know, and you're also doing your financing slightly different because you have large upfront costs. So, so, but I think unless you can prove you're using the spectrum and that the incoming use is actually going to have a negative effect, you've got to use assumptions. You've got to do, even if you don't know what that use really looks like, even if it's a made up use and Daniel comes and invents a new service, I've got to make certain assumptions about a service, even if he's not doing it and show, you know what, this is going to be a problem to my existing users. Um, and then of course, there's always economic. Um, economic benefits to a country, um, you know, pride of a country and technology and so forth. That's, that's another play, but I think that comes secondary. So just my view. All right, well, a very good view coming from a former regulator. Mahanid, uh, what's your perspective? What arguments at the end of the day really have currency, which wins? Yeah, I think you touched on the digital divide. I think that's a really important aspect for our, for our industry that satellite really is one of the key technologies to essentially uh, provide connectivity to all just purely by the global coverage that we provide. And also with the NGSOs, the mega constellations that will even cover the North and the South, Southern Poles as well. So 
the truly whole uh, global connections. Um, and that resonates a lot. But I actually want to echo what Jennifer said, because in our industry, we suffer with something out of sight, out of mind. People are able to see their mobile phones, their Wi-Fi routers every day, but they don't get to see the satellites. And they don't sometimes become aware of the service that it's providing. So when we talk to the regulators, one of the th th key things they look for is uh, the economical benefits to their citizens. So uh, echoing what Jennifer was saying about the use is something that we have to demonstrate uh, by using case studies and bringing to their attention the critical services, for example, in the civil aviation that satellite relies on, uh, maritime and the, and the in-flight connectivity that we mentioned, but also the cellular backhaul to the MNOs that we provide. A lot of these technologies and services are not visible to the everyday uh, citizens. And certainly the regulators need to be aware of that. So trying to bring the economical value, not just for current usage, but also for projected future projects in the QNV band, for example, that's something that we, uh, I wouldn't say struggle with, but we probably need to do a better job at to try and uh, make sure that regulators' priorities, making sure that their citizens are benefited and, and provided the, the, the services that they need. And we have to uh, convince them that satellite has a role to play. It has a seat on the table. And that's one of the things that we continuously try and improve on. Thanks, Mohanad. And you make an excellent point about um, satellite. I mean, we, we, we proclaim, and it's true, satellite is ubiquitous. But with ubiquity comes anonymity, unfortunately. And uh, and I may be the uh, the oldest person on screen, but I remember the day when you'd watch a television broadcast and on the bottom, it would say live via satellite because satellite was new, cool technology and you were aware of it. Now, uh, not necessarily. And it's incumbent on the industry, particularly with the regulators, uh, to remind them of um, how the industry is um, not your grandfather's technology. It really has evolved and, and is helping uh, make those um, uh, those public policy objectives uh, real. Um, Daniel or Alex, anything? Daniel, go ahead. Sure. Um, I'll let, I'd just like to go back to something that Jennifer said. You know, use is really important, obviously, being able to demonstrate um, your use. Um, but unfortunately, it's not always enough. <laughs> it's like you, you need that as a baseline and then you need to go further because um, the attacks on the K band began after we started using it. Um, <laughs> And we still nearly lost it. Um, the, the tax on C-band began after we've after we've, we've been using it for decades, uh, and we still lost Spectrum. So uh, I'd say that um, the, the the additional layer we need beyond use is to, is to show how we fit in with the public policy goals of the administration's uh, concerned, right? So um, if the, if the goal is closing the digital divide, you know that's that's something that we're really good at. You know, there are some really important things that satellites are, are objectively good at um, that we need to um, uh, put forward as to, you know, that's justification for why we need, we, we, we need spectrum. Um, you know, network resilience. Uh, these are the kinds of things that, that, that <clears throat> they'll miss us if we're gone. <laughs> you know, um, and, and these qualitative arguments um, are really important because, you know, we, we just don't compare in terms of relative size and economic heft uh, with the mobile industry. But that doesn't mean that, that what we do isn't important and, and critical to the public policy goals of, of various nations. So um, if we can back up our use and our investments with a, a compelling um, public policy story, I think that's, that's, how, um, that's how we end up um, persuading uh, governments. Thanks, Daniel, uh, and really good additional perspective. Alex, any uh, final words um, in terms of what are the compelling arguments uh, to regulators? Thanks, David. Uh, yes, I, I think a lot of uh, very good points already covered by, by my panelists that, that I echo as well. I think from my perspective, I, what Daniel said really resonates with me and, and I agree, use is, use is very important, but understanding and getting a public perception of the value of satellite and the impact that we provide to global economy and global services. Satellites are very unique. We, we can deploy uh, communication services uh, at a very rapid pace, 
agreed that networks are take take some time to deploy, but we have a lot of good case studies of being able to deploy rapidly uh, when needed. Uh, and this is not something that terrestrial networks uh, can can necessarily provide. And, and also, we we do have another unique case is that we can provide a global network. Um, within our services and really connect the un unconnected and provide services where, where they're really needed and might be ignored by, by other services because there might not be an economic need. So I, I think imp improving the public messaging of, of where satellites really fit in and, and where uh, we benefit society as a whole uh, in combination with the use cases, I think is a very important message that we should uh, propagate worldwide. Thank you. Jennifer, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I, I think maybe just to put a twist on this a little bit, it's also growth and innovation. And I know um, with some bands, and I, I'll leave them quiet for now, there was a view by some regulators, so some on the panel know what I'm talking about, that maybe there wasn't enough growth and enough innovation in certain bands, and that put them at greater risk. You know, And, and I, I think that's something that the I, I'm actually really um, excited the satellite industry is involved with. There's things like 3GPP, where we're becoming part of the standards. But even there, we've seen um, at the last 3GPP meeting, there was opposition at the last plenary to including the KA band for satellite. Um, once again, part of my view that this is going to come up again at, uh, at the next WRC. Um, um, we're trying um, at the ITU to include satellite into the IMT 2020 standard, the ITU's version of 5G. I think getting included, and I think we are an important part of 5G, and I think we're going to be even a bigger part of 6G, which of course is the internet of the census. But I think getting captured and becoming part of these global networks and not being a standalone service, you know, I think that's it. So some people have had bad experiences with satellite in the past. If you you know, go back a couple, I say, you know, 10, 15 years ago, um, before any of us were born, because we're so young, um, except for Alex, who probably really wasn't that old then, but um, we, you know, satellite was not seen, as, you didn't have as good an experience as you today, and I think today you have a very good experience. Um, so, so part of it is, how do you show that it's going to help? How you know things like us providing saddle, uh, backhaul for five G is really important. Us providing service where people can't get it is really important. But you're going to see more and more integration, more and more satellite integrated. For instance, um, IoT networks that are you know integrated and provide both services. Um, a million different ways it's going to happen. And, and I think the technology trends that we're heading towards are really important. But we are facing opposition from the terrestrial industry who of course sees it as a, a competitive threat and also a threat as access to spectrum. So I think those are things we really need to include. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me now and uh, turn to questions coming from the audience and I thank the audience for your patience. Um, if we do not get to your question, um, we will uh, ideally tomorrow, but uh, certainly on Monday, post written responses uh, to your questions. We are gonna ask immediately following this panel, uh, for all the panelists to respond to the questions we did not get to. So the first question I, I want to turn to uh, comes from uh, Rose Crochier. Um, and Rose is saying, for those countries who don't yet have a space cap capability, they don't have domestic space industry or private sector, why should they care about spectrum regulation? Um, does it matter to them if they don't have uh, their own domestic space industry? Um, who, who wants to tackle this first question from Rose? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah thank you, Rose, for, for the question. Great question. Um, one thing I'd like to first highlight is, uh, I forgot to mention in, in my previous insight about the WRC, is that uh, there is an agenda item called the agenda item every WRC, and it's to do with improvement to satellite process an equitable access to the satellite um, uh, orbital locations. Um, and what we've seen is a lot of developing countries are actually very interested and involved in that particular agenda item because they have aspiring programs for their satellite industry. And you'll see that in Africa, uh, in the Middle East, in Asia, not just in the established uh, continent where the satellite industry uh, is, is well established. So, 
I think the trend is that there will be much more countries that will have their own national satellite programs, whether it's scientific or, or commercial civil use. So uh, I think that's a, a trend that we will see continue. Uh, as for the specifics of the question, why should they care? I think they should care because much like what we've just said in the answer to the previous question, the critical services that satellite provide, sometimes they are not aware of. You mentioned TV broadcasting. A lot of that is done over the satellite. If you watch a, a famous World Cup or a final or a Formula One Grand Prix, a lot of that is delivered to your home via satellite. Um, and the way aircraft land on airports, the connectivity to provide safe landing is done over satellites. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why regulators need to be aware of. And that's why, and, you know, to, to sort of pick it back on the previous question, on the policy decisions that regulators are developing or countries are developing, you are now seeing the satellite uh, aspect is included, or if it's not included, we should be doing a better job in making sure that they are part of that policy roadmap that they have in place. Um, so that definitely they are recognizing that, even though they might not have their own national program, they recognize that satellite has a role to play. Thank you, Mahan. Anyone else? Daniel? Yeah, um, I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, as as Mahan had said, look, if you're obviously if if a country has ambition to be a, a to have a space industry, then you should really care about uh, future access to satellite spectrum. Um, there's often this disconnect between you know those who would like to have a big space industry and then who then take away at the same time take away all the spectrum that would be used for that industry. Um, and um, so clearly, if you, you if you, if a country does have those ambitions, they should care. But even if the country does not have those ambitions, right, um, and does not have a domestic space industry, satellites can provide some massive benefits in that in in in, in the country that should not be overlooked. Um, let me just give you some examples. Uh, in Peru, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in the mountains of Papua New Guinea, our company provides 4G. It enables 4G to be, to be deployed in those areas that would otherwise be unreachable or very expensive to reach uh, using terrestrial technologies. So that's, that's an immediate benefit. You know, uh, in these countries, they now have 4G in places that they didn't have 4G before, okay? Um, and we, we, we're expanding this to, to 5G. You know, we, we, we're deploying ever higher throughput satellites. Um, and our ability to support 5G backhaul, as a number of my colleagues have said, is, is, is there. We've actually done some trials with a major US um, uh, mobile operator. Um, and they've been extremely promising to the point that they are probably going to be, you know, uh, asking for some, some capacity from us to, to help uh, with their 5G networks. So that's, um, as, as a country, you should, you, should, you should think about that, not just from a space industry perspective, but what, what, but what can be done with the satellite services. And another way to, 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 to rethink the question is, you know, a country might not produce any fiber optic cable in their country, but they still think it's important, right? Um, so same, same with the satellite industry, right? Um, just because you don't make satellites in, in your country doesn't mean that, you know, you can't take advantage of them. Thanks. Excellent points. Uh, before I turn to the next question, does anyone have anything else to add? Jennifer. A very minor point, um, uh, res emergency response and preparedness. Mm -hmm. I, I can't think of a single country that has not had to rely on satellite after a, a, you know, a severe emergency where there's no terrestrial infrastructure. So that's something that's of interest to every country, whether it's fixed satellite, they're using our mobile, doesn't matter. There's been some form of satellite required. And even if they didn't have it resident in you know, their country for that use or at that location, it gets flown in. So thank you, just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, we, yeah, we just help restore, sorry, just quickly. We just help restore Tonga, right? Yeah. Tonga lost connectivity after the uh, volcanic eruption and the satellite industry was there to help out. Right, and, and I know Endelsat also uh, quickly responded to Tonga and even in developed countries, I know from my own uh, personal experience uh, following uh, you know, uh, Hurricane Katrina, um, you know, where the satellite industry stepped up to provide connectivity when the cell towers uh, you know, were, were, were non-existent. 
David, we were up for eight months in Staten Island in New York City, providing service to users who still didn't have their terrestrial service restored. So I think and that's New York City. I say proudly as a New Yorker. <laughs> Yeah, so um, you know, ver very much a, a critical component, a critical uh, need uh, post disasters for satellite connectivity. Thank you. Um, the next question has to do with uh, 28 gigahertz. Um, how do you view the coexistence of a band of the 28 gigahertz with the mobile industry? Since urban and indoor is where the mobile industry needs this most. And this comes from uh, someone uh, anonymous, but. Um, who would, who would want to talk about coexistence with mobile in 28? You know, too, I was going to say, is it too hot a potato? But Jennifer, you're going to take that potato. Go ahead. I'm saying, I'm saying first. I'm looking at his smile. I think you, uh, you, you got it. Yeah, go, go ahead, Jennifer. So, so um, and at my internet says it's unstable, so I'm sorry if I have a problem. Um, that's what I get for using terrestrial wireline. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Um, this is a huge issue and it depends on the use case as well for the terrestrial. What is true is you can't have two widely deployed ubiquitous services providing service in the same frequency band. And, and that requires, you, you just, uh, like putting aside MSS, ATC, put aside all that, but generally, this is true whether it's two terrestrial widely deployed services or satellite and a terrestrial wide deployed services from a coordination perspective. And that's probably the first issue. What we saw happen in the United States, which was the wrong approach, in my view, is um, they took a portion of the band 27.5 to 28.35 and said, that's a band that's traditionally been used for gateways. We're going to limit it to these large satellite or stations, non-consumer. And we're going to make you operate in the most rural and remote portions of the country where no people live and where there's very little access to roads um, or other infrastructure. That, that's a mistake on our part. We're making it work, um, but, it, but it ends up increasing costs because you may have to lay fiber to those locations. There aren't trained staff necessarily who are able to drive, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, it, it seems to be a big mistake by limiting the flux. You also can't allow satellite to innovate and perhaps come up with new solutions in those bands. So I think David, Daniel looks like he wants to talk. So I'm going to turn it over to him for a little bit and I'll come back. But I wanted to at least get that point out. David, Daniel? Thanks. I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing that, that, that regulators should realize is that when, when two services share a band or are required to share a band, like, like, like uh, uh, was forced in, the, in parts of the 28 gigahertz in, in the US, um, constraints are imposed on both sides, right? So um, the, 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 the terrestrial side can't quite deploy as wide, you know, a, as far and as wide as they might want to. And then the satellites uh, industry is also prevented from expanding to, to, to as many places as, as, as might be, as the market might, might, might want, uh, but the regulation prevents. Um, and that's, that's a waste, right? Um, looking at the K band in, 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 in particular, we can spend our time trying to figure out whether sharing is possible, how to share, how to do it in a way that's, that's, that's good for, for, for everybody. The, the, the bottom line is what, what ends up happening is neither service can deploy to the fullest extent in that band when sharing is, is, is mandated. Um, and, and, in, and in some bands, maybe that's, that's you know, there's such a shortage that, that, that that's what you need to do. But in the K band, there was never the shortage. You could provide for all of your, your, your millimeter wave 5G in 26 gigahertz. There's 3,250 megahertz worth of spectrum there. That's enough to support four MNOs with 800 megahertz each. Um, and they can deploy wherever they want, all right? Fully deployed, full potential. And you can keep the 28 gigahertz for satellite. And then satellites can deploy wherever they want. Maximum deployment, full, 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 full potential, as opposed to having what, what feels like two somewhat crippled services um, in the 28 gigahertz band. And I think it's important to keep that bigger picture in mind, that sharing and coexistence is not a panacea. It may be necessary and unavoidable in some instances, 
but there may be a, a better a better solution, a more optimal solution, um, if only we would look for them. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Mahanad, I saw you raising your hand. You want to add something? Yeah, I'll just, uh, just jump in just to highlight uh, an important point that as an industry, satellite is not opposed to sharing. We actually share adequate with fixed services for decades. We've been sharing with other technologies. Even with our land, there's a lot of uh, potential to share with them. Unfortunately, it's the terrestrial, the mobile particularly sector, does not like sharing. And whenever you see a mobile uh, new entrant in, identified for a spectrum, they always seek exclusive access. And I think that's an inefficient way of, of going about doing business. And unfortunately, regulators are, you know, need to come up to speed with that aspect and how you efficiently use spectrum. Uh, for example, now in the UK, um, there is mandates in, in the licensing conditions for MNOs to share there at least the base stations, the capex of the infrastructure. But I think we can go beyond that and, and see if they can share the spectrum, just like satellite does today. We do a lot of coordination with our colleagues from the other operators to ensure that we adequately share the same spectrum. Um, but to turn on to 28 gigahertz specifically, uh, in the first question, uh, Daniel mentioned, uh, and Jennifer also mentioned that the reason why the WRC did not decide on a 28 gigahertz is because they realized the value of FSS in that spectrum. And therefore, they gave an alternative, which is the 26 gigahertz range. And that's where mobile 5G could actually deploy. Um, and I believe the, the market models for 5G in these millimeter waves will be for indoor use because of the propagation characteristics, um, especially with modern cities, double glazed windows, the frequencies are not able to penetrate such uh, infrastructure. So there is alternative beyond the 28, there is the 26. There are other bands in the, in the 37 and in the 50 gigahertz as well. So I think there is uh, a win-win solution. Unfortunately, it's when countries take a unilateral position outside the IT framework, you end up with this challenge of how you can manage both services. Um, but I think there is a win-win, as, as mentioned. Thank you. Thanks, Mahanad. And uh, as, as uh, you may have seen in the chat function, we're approaching the, the end of our hour. And with the, um, the panelists' indulgence and the audience as well, I'm going to go a few minutes past the top of the hour uh, because we do have a number of uh, uh, really good questions. And uh, there's one question I think really focused, um, a quick question for Alex. Um, Alex, and this comes from uh, Bruce Elbert. Has the seven-year clock started on Kuiper? Uh, yes, thanks, Bruce, for the, for the question. The seven-year clock has started for Kuiper. The seven-year clock starts with the introduction of a satellite filing to the ITU, and we have submitted filings in uh, 2019. So we, we have the clock running for deployment of our cons constellations, um, and we will intend to meet that. Thanks very much, Alex. Um, here's a question and it was kind of touched upon and this, this question comes from uh, Morris Ettinger. And Morris is uh, bringing up, I think, some of the um, concerns with use of satellite. And Morris said, asks, how do you deal with a high absorption loss in higher frequencies? And still we have rain attenuation. Uh, it makes it less attractive. And I think in, in so many words, uh, Morris is pointing out at least some of the historical uh, concerns with use of satellite. Uh, so who wants to address those um, historical concerns? Are, the, are they still the case? Uh, Alex. Thanks, uh, and thank you for the question. The, the higher frequency bands, especially the Q and V bands, do have a high absorption rate, as you, as you pointed out, but that also has uh, advantages to it. So for sharing between satellite systems, it makes sharing the sharing process a little easier because the beams would be uh, smaller. Additionally, technology is catching up that we can we can operate in these particular bands, and there's also an advantage to operate in these particular bands because we can achieve a higher higher throughput. So while there is disadvantages with regards to the rain absorption, satellite technology is catching up that we can operate in their bands, and there are definitely opportunities uh, to provide services in these high frequency bands. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. If I, if I may just uh, follow up on that, we had the same thing say about KA band, by the way. 
okay a band with rain fade how are you going to achieve this but uh, now you see the reality it, innovation and in, in our industry's ability to innovate uh, for example not on a sp- not only on a spacecraft like alex mentioned you can now provide high throughput satellite but even very high throughput satellite throughputs um, gigabits uh, terabits per second in in some cases so that it's definitely an opportunity, but also the innovation on the ground segment where the ability to uh, introduce higher coding enables us to actually uh, overcome a lot of these challenges. Now you're seeing phased array antennas with higher frequencies, you're actually um, challenged with the alignment as well. But with phased array, phased array in, uh, antennas, you're able to align uh, with, with these higher frequencies, much like you, you have in, in KA band. I think in Q and V band, definitely a lot of these challenges not only are being overcome, but will be overcome. But also how we uh, target uh, our uh, services. So for Intelsat, for example, we're looking at the Q and V band predominantly for in-flight connectivity, where uh, airplanes at such high altitudes are able to mitigate some of these uh, propagation challenges. Uh, Or you can limit them for gateway services, Again, large teleports, you're able to uh, overcompensate a lot of these uh, propagation challenges. So it really depends on how you do it, but we have every confidence because there's multi-billion investment going on behind the scene towards these frequencies. And rest assured, the due diligence that goes into these investments, of course, has to take into account such challenges. And if they are not overcome, then you won't see the investment. But uh, thankfully, we are seeing investment in UNB band. Thanks, Mahan. And it wasn't more than a few years ago, you would occasionally hear on a phone call an echo um, and say, oh, this must be going by satellite. No more do you hear that. Um, and again, the technology um, very much uh, uh, it addresses the concerns that, uh, that Morris is, has raised. Um, Daniel, uh, briefly, because I, I do in the remaining few minutes want to give panelists an opportunity to summarize, but uh, Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, just to follow up on, on, on what Mahan had said. Yeah, we are meeting those challenges. Um, and, um, you know, just to add to the list of things that we do, um, you know, there's adaptive power control to, uh, increase power when, uh, when there's rain, there's adaptive coding modulation to maintain the link, um, uh, at the cost of some throughput, uh, it, when, when there's, uh, absorption and, uh, there's, um, there's something as, uh, as, as simple as, as, as gateway diversity sites, you know, so there's rain in one place, you just switch to the other gateway. Um, so there are, there, there are many, many methods um, that have been developed. You know, <laughs> I remember when KU ban was being uh, uh, um, uh, attacked for you know, being uh, susceptible to rain. And now we're in K and now we're moving to Q and V ban. Um, there's every reason to think that we'll overcome these challenges. Thank you. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, we have a quick question uh, for Jennifer that comes from uh, Craig Barner. Uh, Craig's asking, Jennifer, can you clarify what part of the KA band was threatened at WRC 2019? Of course, 27.5 to 30 gigahertz. And then it was back down to 27.5 to 28.35, but both failed. Thank you. Uh, okay, our friend Peter DeSeldin has a, a two part question. Um, and let's, we'll make this, I think, the, the final question for this uh, session. And again, for those questions that we did not get to, um, we're going to ask the panelists to provide written answers, which will be posted on GVF's website, if not on Friday, then certainly on Monday. Uh, first question that uh, Peter asks, um, you mentioned 28 gigahertz and the narrow escape at WRC 19. How serious is the threat that individual nations will opt out and allocate this for IMT, regardless of the world radio, communi- world radio communications? And is 3GPP a good actor here? Uh, so let, let's answer that first question. Who wants to tackle uh, 28 and the threat? All right, Daniel, uh, and then Mahanad, and then Jen. I, 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 think, I think the short answer is um, uh, individual countries remain a threat. <laughs> um, there are a number of industrial interests um, that um, continue to uh, push the 28 gigahertz as a 5G spectrum. Um, and, um, you know, these manufacturers continue to go around the world saying, let's do it here because we've, we've already got equipment here. Um, and so we continue to fight the good fight uh, on a country by country basis. 
to try to talk some sense. <laughs> I like to put it, you know, I, I'm not sure how, how else to put it. Um, there's all the spectrum available at 26, and yet the prioritization is for the 28, um, and that's being pushed by by, by some companies. Um, and it's just not necessary. The 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 growth in demand in the, for millimeter five five G, you know, we just just look at Korea. Um, it's so anemic um, so far. So so why 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 deprive another productive industry of spectrum in order to serve demand, which is slow to develop would be one way to put it um, when there's all this other spectrum where you can experiment and, and wait for, for other, for these applications to, to evolve without having to put um, satellite industry in, uh, in jeopardy. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, uh, when Daniel talks of Korea, it reminded me of a colleague who once analogized the, um, uh, the request for more spectrum to when he was a child, if he asked his uh, parents for seconds at the dinner table before he finished his first, um, his parents would say, no, um, you don't get food that when you haven't cleaned your plate uh, already. Mahanid, um, over to you on Peter's question about 28, and then uh, quickly Jennifer and Alex. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for the question. Well, first of all, I think uh, we respect every, mem every country is a sovereign state. They are uh, sovereign to make their own decisions but I trust that they make the decisions based on international treaties. So by and large, I think the, a lot of countries around the world, if not most countries, respect the ITU family and the framework of ITU. And there is a framework for 26 gigahertz to deploy 5G if countries wish to do so. So I think a lot of countries will respect that. Of course, there are individuals who are countries who have went unilaterally on a different direction, predominantly for political reasons, sometimes because they have a, a, a big market themselves that they can make such a decision. But not all countries are in that position. For example, the USA did it in the rest of the world. But I, I still think the rest of the world will respect the outcome from the ITU. And I remember in 2014, uh, an actual uh, true story where we actually met with Samsung uh, in, uh, in Korea, and we asked, why is the push for 28 gigahertz so, um, you know, aggressive from, from, from Korea? And let's not forget, Samsung contributes over 20% to the GDP of the Korean economy. So that cloud in that country. Their answer was, we don't use 28 gigahertz inside Korea for anything, for satellite, for anything. So that was driving a lot of their decisions for 28 gigahertz. But... Like we mentioned earlier, a lot of countries do use KA band 28 gigahertz for satellite. So I think we will respect the outcome from the ITU. And I hope that um, that will continue because it's a very important organization. It's the oldest organization that we know of as a, as a nation uh, in this world. Um, as for the 3GPP, I think there is a definite opportunity for us as an industry. Uh, we need to do more to be involved in that. Uh, Jennifer touched upon this the standardization bodies that are taking place. Now you're seeing in release 17, in release 18 of these standards will have a non-terrestrial uh, uh, component, which is the satellite, uh, to provide connectivity and an interface between the 5G terrestrial and the satellite um, uh, connectivity. So I think that will continue and we see an opportunity there uh, as, a, as an individual. Thank you, Mahanid. Uh, Jennifer and Alex, uh, quickly, and then we'll uh, ask you to summarize. Go ahead, so Peter, Jennifer. Peter probably remembers this, and thanks for the question. So I started my career in spectrum on in 28 gigahertz on trying to get a NGSO spectrum in 28 gigahertz for teledesic. At the same time that those band plans were being done, um, we were also reserving in the US spectrum for something called LMDS, which was a terrestrial service. Um, I'm very happy to say that I'm living to see the day where NGSOs and of course O3B was an early, uh, early developer, but now we've got the mega constellations, which I think are kind of building on my old client Teledesic's, um, you know, legacy of you know of, of bringing an economic, uh, you know, an economically sustainable NGSO system, Leo system to the globe. So, you know, I, I think that's something that's very important to keep in mind. The terrestrial industry has been promising and promising and you know, already in the in their 2000s, um, O3B was clearly deployed. We're seeing you know, other thousands of satellites being deployed in the band. So I think that's a really important part, but we still fight it. I just wanted to build on one thing Daniel said, 
not just on a country by country way, but we are extremely active in the different um, regional organizations. And we think that's critical because there are some efforts by the terrestrial industry to try and get band plans and other things through the regional groups that would try and encourage countries to move away from satellite usage. So that's something important. On 3GPP, fully agree with Mohammed. We've been very active there as, as a number of the folks companies here. I think the biggest issue is it, there's still a lot of anti-competitive conduct on there. And you know, it's a, it's a different organization where um, the members behave in different ways. So I think we still have a lot of work to continue to progress. I was thrilled that we're coming out with the standard in release 17 that includes non-terrestrial networks. And I'm hopeful that we'll keep going. And, and same with the ITU work that we're doing on a satellite component of IMT 2020, and then hopefully beyond that. So thank you, David. Thanks, Jennifer. So Alex, you get the final word on, on Peter's question. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you for the question, Peter. I, I, I think similar to, to the other panelists uh, and the question on the satellite, I think that the use case for any additional spectrum uh, should be demonstrated. And the terrestrials have uh, plenty of, uh, spectrum that that is available and the use case should should definitely be there so uh we definitely hope the industries and regulators respect uh the international regulations that were adopted uh and thank you all right thank you all all right so panelists um we are really coming up uh, against the, uh, the the clock here let me ask each of you if you care to uh, just summarize or make some final points and i'll start with with jennifer uh jennifer over to you yes i, I do want to make one point and since we started this with I'm trying to really talk to the business teams I, I think people need to understand this takes resources and probably one of the things all of us can agree is that our budgets just like every other group in a company are never big enough but if you think about it, we have to touch many, many countries, many, many regulators. Regulators don't come to these conclusions unless you're talking to them. And this, the terrestrial industry is so well financed. Um, you know, our organizations like Global VSAT Forum are terrific, but are very thinly staffed. Um, and we don't necessarily have as large presence um, as operators in many countries as the terrestrial industry. So I'd say to support us and also to think of these issues besides for what Daniel talked about the day to day, but really most of these are long term projects and you've got to make investment to reach the benefits of, of um, what we saw at, at work 2015, for instance, where we were able to um, do away at least for that conference and the next couple of conferences, the threat from IMT and, and the terrestrial industry in 28. So thank you, David. And thank you again for inviting me. It's been a great discussion. Thanks, Jennifer, and thanks for the uh, well-articulated plea for resources. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to uh, get a final word in? Uh, Mohamed? Yeah, uh, again, just echo uh, our compliments for inviting us. Uh, I think uh, just to conclude that, uh, by and large, the connectivity challenges around the world is not caused necessarily by spectrum shortages. It is infrastructure of mobility and coverage. And I say this with the backdrop that satellite continues to provide critical services that cannot be provided by other means. And it will be welfare destruction to accommodate other technologies that are not going to provide the coverage aspect that are so much needed in, 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 in many different countries around the world. So I hope we put our case. There is a win-win balanced approach where regulators uh, need to find uh, better ways to utilize existing spectrum, refarming spectrum or sharing spectrum where possible. Uh, and we definitely advocate for that win-win approach uh, uh, wherever we have a platform to speak on. And satellite will continue to play a role in not just 5G, 6G, but also with our land, with, with other technologies um, successfully. Thank you. Thanks, Mahanad, for the uh, good words about the availability of win-win solutions. Um, Daniel or Alex, uh, Alex, do you want uh, some final words? Yes, thank you, David. And thank you for inviting me to the this panel and thank you for uh, everyone attending. Just wanted to conclude, I, I saw in the question and answer that there are a number of questions regarding NGSO constellations in general. And then similarly, as we spoke of the benefits of the future uh, for satellite in general. And I think that NGSO issues are being discussed at the WITU and worldwide regulations. And we believe that uh, win-win solutions of sharing spectrum with other services, including within the FSS, uh, will be will be accomplished. So thank you again for letting us participate in this panel.
Thanks very much, Alex. And uh, Daniel, uh, any any final, final words? Sure, sure. Just to say, um, you know, we're living in very exciting times in the sailing industry. I don't think there's been so much um, uh, massive innovation or massive investment in this industry. Um, you know, it's just... In, in my relatively short career in this in this field, this is this has been the most exciting times, um, and it would be you know, but but for us to realize all our ambitions and and, and all the new services uh, and all the new innovations, we're going to need the spectrum, um, and uh, I hope that uh, you know we uh, that, that that that's recognized you know as we go forward. Thanks very much. Thank you, Daniel, and uh, thanks all in the audience as well for staying with us. Um, there are a few questions uh, we did not get to. And as I said, we will be asking the panelists to provide uh, the written responses. Um, finally, uh, you can watch a recording of this panel as well as previous uh, panels on um, gvf.org. Uh, and the final uh, note is that we will be having our next webinar uh, on February 24 at the same time, 3 p.m. Uh, UK time, 10 a.m. Uh, East, US East Coast time. And the topic of our next panel on 24 February is NGSOs, not just for new entrants. Okay, so with that, thank you all. Uh, have a very good day and uh, very much appreciate all the excellent questions. Goodbye. <laughs>